so good morning welcome everyone to yet an, another tuesday morning with uh, i fix pediatric orthopedic journal club and uh, 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 we have today dr mithen shet uh, who is a sports medicine consultant and uh, he is attached uh, to srcc nh children hospital as a pediatric and adolescent sports medicine this is a topic uh, unfortunately about Uh, which we know little, but we need to learn much more. Uh, all of us deal with golfer's elbow and uh, swimmer's shoulder, and you know so many conditions. And uh, there are so many ankle sprains we get, and we really don't know what is the right approach to treat these injuries and prevent these injuries. So we are going to do this in two parts uh, today. Uh, Mithen is going to take us through a very well researched. Uh, profiles of pediatric sports injuries and uh, uh, in a second part of this talk we are going to do a true journal club where he will you know take us through some of the landmark journal articles uh, on pediatric sports medicine so this is not about arthroscopy this is not about surgery it is not even about you know fixing a fracture or uh, you know doing a ligament repair this is going to be more about what are the common sports injuries uh, and what are the causes for them and how should we be addressing and preventing them it's completely new chapter it's a, it's a book by itself and uh, i request uh, dr mithin shah to you know address this issue thank you mithin sure thank you for this opportunity sir i i hope you can hear me well and see my screen as well can you hear yes, me yes yes mithin yeah everything okay. good perfect please proceed right so as sir has spoken uh, in the introduction children are not little adults and when we talk about sports injuries uh, there are certain specifics in children and adolescents which need to be discussed and which everyone needs to know about certain general principles that we are going to discuss today so sports injuries in adolescents are divided into 50% each during practice or training and 50% during game time or competition similarly 50% of the injuries are acute or traumatic and 50% of them are overuse injuries which tells us that there is a big proportion that is prevention uh, that is preventable and most of our discussions uh, most of our philosophies and all the programs that we plan to develop must focus just on these two things one to reduce the injuries that are preventable and to enhance sports performance obviously so when we talk of overuse injuries uh, and we'll dwell into specifics during the next part as i mentioned in 15 days from now and you can talk of oscuchlater and severs and uh, sudden stress fractures the jumper's knee facial stress reactions and tendinopathies but the idea is that most of these injuries are due to repeated repeated micro trauma they're all uh, growth related they can be due to various causes including training errors poor technique uh, in inadequate equipment poor environment excessive sports training muscle weaknesses and imbalances but the most important factor common factor through all of these is inadequate rest now we'll deal into individual uh, sports injury profiles and try and discuss what's pertinent to every sport so when you talk of soccer for example 70% of the injuries are traumatic and just 30% overuse how come because this involves intense contact most of the injuries that we see uh, are contact injuries with the ball or the other players and of course you have certain non contact injuries where uh, there are hard cuts or sharp turns of the pivoted foot most of it is seen in the lower limb so uh, hamstring strains quadriceps strains uh, adductor strains and abdominal strains form a big proportion and then there are knee and ankle injuries and of course uh, 5% of the injuries are related to concussions or head or face injuries you can say the risk factors when we discuss about them you will see a common pattern here across the board that previous injury is always the greatest risk for a fresh injury as far as soccer is concerned children less than 14 years have a propensity to our upper extremity injuries and uh, 
that the year of peak height velocity is very important because uh, when you talk of these profiles of under 11, under 13, under 15, the early maturing players uh, are seen to have higher injury rates. Uh, artificial turf definitely leads to more risk, but in Tier 1 cities, for example, in Mumbai now, uh, the newer third and fourth generation turfs are as good as the natural turfs. And the most important thing that we must always discuss is prevention. So, especially with soccer, the International Olympic Committee has developed fantastic conditioning programs and we'll talk about those a little later, uh, like the FIFA 11 or the FIFA 11 Plus, which uh, have been proven through research to reduce uh, soccer injuries, especially the non-contact ones. And uh, the other way to deal with this is also to speak to the coaches uh, locally. And, you know, you must see more red cards and more yellow cards during the game, especially when uh, you have children playing. Uh, this is just to reduce their innate on-field aggressiveness. So one specific injury that we want to discuss is the ACL, because uh, that's something very common that we see coming in into our department. Overall, the risk of the first injury is 1 in 30 in females and 1 in 50 in males. So you see that the risk of injury in females is almost one and a half times those of males. And uh, the return to sports after ACL injury is not as good as we know. So it's around 80%. 80% uh, of people uh, or children return to some kind of sport. And as far as adults are concerned, hardly 50% only return to the same level of competitiveness. Uh, Whereas if you talk about adolescents, then it's a little better. That's around 80%. Now, if once you have an ACL injury, the risk of the second surgery is around 15% in adults. When, when you talk about those aged 25 and under, it's 20%. And when you talk of those aged 18 and under, it's around 30 to 40%. And that's really high, which is why we must focus on ACL injury prevention. Uh, how do you prevent something? You recognize it much better. So to recognize something, you need to know the risk factors. So non-contact ACL ruptures uh, can have all those factors that we know about but can't do anything about. So those are non-modifiable, include environmental and anatomic factors. So what are the anatomic factors? That's like something that people are born with. It's like if you have a narrow notch in your knee and uh, these notches you can divide into three parts. So you have something like an A notch, a U notch uh, and a W notch. And the A notch is like the alphabet A, which is very narrow. So most of these patients have a smaller ACL uh, they have a smaller femoral notch and these are non-modifiable factors where uh, the female, uh, the adolescent female has a higher risk of an ACL injury. Similarly, uh, the slope of the tibia is something that people are born with. So if the child has an increased slope and it's been proven by research that if the posterior tibial slope is more than 12%, uh, then there is definitely an increased risk of uh, an ACL and probably a second ACL in the same knee. And these are the patients where post-skeletal maturity, we're thinking of uh, a bony correction for the increased slope as well. Uh, Baten's criteria uh, talks up, uh, is something that we use to judge uh, generalized laxity. And if you have a criteria more than five, if you have a hyperlax female adolescent athlete, that's again a non-modifiable risk factor. Uh, there is this concept of benching currently uh, in most of the European leagues, especially uh, in the adolescent age group between 12 and 20, where you have players uh, in, the, in a cohort of around 20. There are two females at one time that are benched uh, in just about the end of the pre-ovulation and the ovulatory period, because uh, that's been proven to have lax ligaments and a zone where there is a very high propensity of an ACL injury. So all of these we thought of were almost non-modifiable. And then there are so many others that we should work on because if we want to reduce the number of ACLs and ACL avulsions coming in uh, to our departments, we must speak to the physiotherapists, the athletic trainers and the coaches locally to look for poor landing biomechanics. So femoral adduction, a dynamic knee adduction, so that's a dynamic valgus, which includes foot overpronation or ankle eversion, uh, quadriceps dominance, uh, 
asymmetry, poor quadriceps and hamstring co-contraction, poor core strength and trunk control. These are important things that we can change in children. So if you talk about kicking and landing, so there are certain uh, provocative positions, like for example, you can look on the screen on the left side, uh, there is less hip flexion, more knee extension, and the ankle is dorsiflexed. And this is one of those injuries, if uh, this is the way the kid's going to land, then uh, definitely on a bad day, there is a higher chance of a non-contact ACL rupture. So you speak to the children, uh, don't talk only about the skills during the game, but talk about these uh, smaller things. And you see that you, there is evidence that you can reduce uh, the incidence. Now, talking about FIFA 11 plus. So 11, FIFA 11 was... Uh, strength and conditioning neuromuscular training program uh, released around eight years back for adults. It's, it's sort of a warm-up program for adults that has been proven to reduce the incidence of ACL injuries during soccer. Recently, FIFA came out with an update, which is again validated, uh, has been proven on certain child cohorts at different ages, especially up to the under 11s. So under 11, under 13, under 15, FIFA 11 plus kids. And this is open source. All of you can access it. The idea is all of these exercises, it's a 10 to 15 minute drill. So at, at any age, if you are a coach or a trainer at the school, uh, we must talk to them and add this as part of their regular warm-up program because it focuses on great hip knee foot lines and uh, it avoids the valgus at the knees and it reduces the incidence of injuries now when you talk of basketball again it's a contact non-contact sport a lot of pivoting involved and a lot of contact uh, with the other players so traumatic injuries are more common than overuse uh, ankle injuries is something that we always associate with basketball and it's been proven uh, with great evidence that ankle bracing, especially for the first time ankle sprainers and those who have come in for the th second and third time as well, uh, must, must go back to field with an ankle brace. We don't do this very often. Uh, sometimes you see kids with an ankle sprain post uh, sport and you have a Salter Harris type 1 uh, distal fibula. Uh, most of them get missed, otherwise they are conserved. And these children then go back and they're going to come back again. They're going to come back again. It leads to recurrent uh, ankle instability. So we must, must remember that bracing and basketball go together. Ankle injury is very common. Also in children, uh, we see the ball, because the ball size is not very regulated. Uh, when they're trying to collect the ball, we're going to see a lot of hand and finger minor injuries. So those come in as well. Females have a higher risk of the knee and ankle injuries, of course, and we must work on the biomechanics and balance deficits. So a lot of proprioception training uh, for these, uh, for the cohort, the sports specific cohort works if you work on their balance deficits. When you talk of wrestling, it's one of those sports where there's contact 100% of the time. So the effective exposure is much higher. Obviously, this leads to more injuries. So traumatic injuries are more common, uh, more in practice than in competition. Uh, again, related to the exposure time, upper extremity and head and neck injuries are very common, 70% of the times. And we're going to talk specifically about sports-related concussions in children where head-to-knee and head-to-head -head contact and sometimes just head-to-mat contact uh, can lead to SRC, that's a sports-related concussion, and I'll come talk about that on the next slide. And uh, the risk factors, of course, the wrestling mat is very important. So we've seen that uh, the socioeconomic strata sometimes uh, and the profile of the kids that come to us uh, who are involved in this sport is not very great. And they are very disciplined and hardworking, but the basics are amiss. So the wrestling mat is very important because it acts as a great shock absorber in head to mat injuries. And uh, most of them have a lot of tinea and uh, dermat infections and illnesses again related. These are issues related to hygiene. Cleaning of the mat is very important. Uh, again, another thing seen is wrestling is uh, the players are divided according to class and the classes are mostly age and weight. So most children try to work 
and try to be the heftiest and the bulkiest in their weight class. So if you are a little uh, thinner, low BMI in your class, then there's more injury. So what they try and do is you try and lose weight 48 hours before competition so that you can drop a class. And this is the biggest factor seen in adult wrestling leading to an increased injury risk which now we are extrapolating to adolescent populations as well. So if you have someone who wants to go from the 58 kg to the 56 kg in adults, uh, they suddenly lose the, that, those two, three kilos in 48 hours by dehydrating themselves. And then when they go on the weigh scale, they drop a class, but this rapid weight loss increases the risk. So all of this is related to coaching education, what your coach tells you uh, and what's important. So if, if we can talk to the coaches and talk about this, that you must monitor and you shouldn't go in for acute weight reduction just for the sake of competition. If you can talk about your body hygiene and cleaning of your mat regularly. And of course, this is not important for adults, but for kids more so. Uh, concussions is something that we want to prevent and headgears are very important. So we know our knee pads and shoe pads and all of those. Uh, but I know wrestling is not associated with headgears. But a lot of associations like in New Zealand uh, and a few more in Europe, they insist that kids are taught the techniques with their helmets on. Uh, it's a little different from the cycling helmet, but it prevents something called as concussion. Now, uh, this is something again very peculiar and related to wrestling itself. So you can see Yogeshwar Dutt and Sushil Kumar and they have funny looking ears. So because of the body to body contact and uh, the great vascularity that exists uh, in our ears, there is uh, an acute and then which eventually becomes recurrent auricular hematoma, which leads to a very ugly ear called as cauliflower ear. And if you can talk about this in the wrestling schools right at the beginning, uh, so because we now have Vinesh Fogart and the Fogart sisters participating. So you're going to have a lot of girls participating in this sport. And if you can treat these auricular injuries, the hematomas and drain them in time when they're kids itself, then they won't go on to have something disfiguring in adults. So what's a sports related concussion? It's a mild traumatic brain injury. So when you talk of the Glasgow coma scale, the GCS is less than five, a direct blow to a head, uh, face or elsewhere, but eventually the impact is transmitted to the head is what's a concussion. It's rapid onset, it's short-lived, it leads to neurological impairment uh, for a short time but resolves spontaneously. How do you recognize this? So if you're a bystander, then there may be a very, very short time for loss of consciousness or you may see a kid with a dazed blank look clutching the head uh, generally, uh, older adolescents come out with the history, but most kids don't. So the older, uh, older kids uh, can give us a history of they're feeling this, they're having some blurred vision and they feel that everything's foggy around them. There's some drowsiness. Uh, they lose balance and sometimes there are slowed reaction times. Sometimes you see female adolescents and I have seen two of these cases where uh, there is sudden aggressiveness or a sudden burst of tears. And that's because the child or the adolescent can't really express what's going on. It's something that's happened for the first time in their life. Again, it's transient and momentary. So we must, RFFP stands for remove from field of play. So if you think that there has been a contact to the head, don't wait, don't try and judge, just remove from field of play. And uh, this is a very nice online tool that IOC recommends. It's called SCAT5. SCAT5 has been validated for children more than 13. Less than 13, there are certain other tools uh, that we can discuss. But this is a concussion assessment tool, which is short, easy to use, uh, can be used by physicians only to just assess uh, what we're going to do next. Essentially, the treatment involves rest. So 24 to 48 hours, just do nothing, rest at home, don't do nothing. And at the end of 48 hours, you go into something called as modified rest. So you initially start basic training, uh, very slow and low. And then you keep the kid under symptom threshold and very slowly uh, increase the quantum of activity. 
and that's GRTP, that's gradual return to play. So there's no hurry at all. And uh, sometimes you wait up to a month before they go into competitive sport. Of course, the golden rule is no return to play on the same day. Come what may, no return to play on the same day. And this is true with soccer, with wrestling, with basketball, any contact sport that you can think of. Thank, uh, in Kolkata, uh, Athletic Kolkata, ATK and a few other teams, uh, they're doing really well and kids have started enrolling into rugby. So again, we are seeing these with rugby as well. Rule changes and enforcement, education. And sometimes there is some evidence in adults, but not in kids that neck muscle strengthening may help reduce the quantum of injury. Martial arts, again, a contact sport. And uh, we just need to know the difference. Uh, I myself didn't a while back. Uh, essentially, karate involves a lot of uh, punches and elbow and knee strikes. More upper injury issues. Taekwondo includes kicks. So a lot of lower injury issues of so kicks and strikes. And uh, the upper injury, upper, in, uh, upper extremity injuries involved in Taekwondo is due to trying to block yourself and protect yourself from kicks. Judo, meanwhile, is totally different. It's absolutely different. So Judo is more like wrestling. The aim is to work the opponent to the ground. So there are no punches, uh, no kicking involved. Uh, but there are a lot of shoulder injuries seen uh, and the upper back issues are seen in judo because there's a lot of uh, contorting of the trunk seen in this sport. Now, thankfully, children in India aren't exposed as yet to mixed martial arts, though adults are. And uh, that's a totally different domain and very scary. The divisions in martial arts are generally according to age, sex, experience and body weight. And what's been seen in, even in children is the higher you go in terms of experience. So when you move from a green to a blue to a purple to a brown to a black belt, uh, brown and black belts are generally allowed, especially in Shotokan Karate, uh, to hit to the head as well, to the face as well. So the risk increases with increase in experience. Karate and Taekwondo, most of the injuries are uh, lower, leg, lower leg and hand and wrist. Whereas judo is uh, the mechanism is because of being thrown over or flipped over and a lot of shoulder injuries come through. So to prevent these, you must improve the defensive skills first. So uh, if anyone in the audience listening to this has been part of karate training, you realize that a lot of strength conditioning, neuromuscular training, balance training is what you start with when you're white and yellow belt. You're only uh, doing the push-ups and the squats and the plies. And then the first thing that you're taught is how to defend yourself, how to strengthen your core and receive, receive, receive. The last thing that they teach the kids is how to punch or kick. Now that comes in later because defensive blocking skills is the most important thing for sports injury prevention in martial arts. Uh, certain rule changes help. Like I remember when uh, I had my black belt exam, I was in eighth standard and this is around 20 years back, that in spite of Head, head hits being allowed during the black belt exam, our supervisor had that one rule because he saw that our cohort population was a little younger, that he, they, they made a fresh rule on the day of the, uh, of the exam that you can't hit to the head. You get a penalty if you hit to the head. And this is very important, especially for the younger kids. Now we move on from contact to non-contact, no contact. So unless you get hit on the road when you're cycling, uh, generally it's a non-contact sport. So, uh, and though, uh, in spite of being no contact, you see that in India, we see a higher proportion of traumatic cycling injuries. And that's not because of uh, anybody fighting while cycling, but you can fall. And when you fall, you fall with your hands stretched out. So clavicle fractures, for example, are very common. Thankfully, uh, we don't have a very high proportion of our population that's interested in cycling, though you see a lot of kids moving around in your building. Uh, when I was in South Korea, there was a great cycling culture and 80% of the population used to cycle. And you'd notice that the commonest fracture that came into the ED was a clavicle fracture. Uh, most of the injuries that we see in kids are abrasions and lacerations. They don't even tell their parents when they are injured. 
uh, but the scary ones that we must try and reduce uh, the incidence is the face and the head injury. Of course, overuse injuries are more seen in older adolescents, those going towards their uh, 20s and 25s, the ones who are really preparing themselves for a professional career in endurance cycling. This is seen more in Europe because there are certain cycling families, so to say, where the father's been part of Tour de France and Tour de Italia all, all his life. And the kid then starts cycling with his father for these long distances of 50 and 100 kilometers. And then what becomes important is uh, the bicycle fit, the bicycle design and the way you sit on the bicycle. Because if you don't sit well, then as you can read, there may be some micro trauma to scrotal contents. Uh, what is very common that we see regularly is anterior knee pain. That's patellofemoral and lateral thigh pain. That's because of the iliotibial band. Uh, between 10 and 14 years, boys are at a higher risk. Generally speaking, most contact sports, uh, non-contact ACLs and everywhere you see that girls are at a higher risk. But this is somewhere where they have some evidence that boys are at a higher risk. And it's all related to the bike and the cycling technique. Bike and the cycling technique. And if you can change these and keep insisting on helmet use, then you can reduce the incidence of injuries. So very small things. And this is a slide just for take home for the audience where they can remember if you have kids, maybe you can click a picture of the screen where you need uh, the lowest center of gravity, uh, the handlebars at comfort level. And uh, if you see the hip, uh, knee, ankle position, the one on the right hand side, the, the kid on the right hand side is the best position actually. So buying a cycle is also something that you can Google. The, a, the AAOS has a campaign that runs uh, and talks about run, riders aren't always in the right. But they are always fragile because they want to reduce the number of road traffic accidents with cyclists. What you can see on the bottom left is uh, the foot pedal position. And this is something also that is never talked about. Like I, I remember myself just using the cycle randomly. Uh, thankfully, now there's a lot of awareness and people are talking about bicycle fits, the handlebars and a lot of other things. Uh, and how you pedal is important. Now, when you talk of dance and gymnastics, uh, both of these have very similar profiles where overuse injuries are more common. Uh, dancing, similar to basketball has a lot of foot and ankle issues. Uh, most of these issues though, unlike basketball, are overuse. So no acute ankle sprains, of course those can happen and ACLs can also happen. But you see a lot of uh, foot pains, ankle pains related to footwear, related to no footwear, uh, FHL tendonitis, Achilles tendonitis, uh, and back pain. So very classic related to young, Adolescent bowlers in cricket and uh, dancers is lumbar uh, spondylolysis, uh, lysis at the L4 or the L5. And then you can see these adolescents getting pain, uh, discomfort while forward flexion and a lot of pain on extension. And when you evaluate them, they already have grade one listesis at around 18. So uh, in dancing, the intrinsic risk factor is someone who dances with insufficient plantar flexion or a hyperflex forefoot, uh, foot pronation. The picture you can see is uh, ballet dancers going into the end point pose. And of course, the surface is important. One thing that has been uh, uh, drilled into our minds is dancing injuries can be reduced by avoiding overstretching. So we don't want these dancers to go, young kids to go into a routine where uh, they see their adult counterparts trying to stretch every part of their body just before going into their routine. Overstretches to be avoided. Uh, there must be fixed routines and of course focus on conditioning programs uh, that talk more about proprioception and balance, neuromuscular control uh, than just strength. Uh, gymnastics, uh, again, upper extremity and lower back issues uh, overused and the acute injuries seen in the ankle. So what are the intrinsic factors? You need to be like a jockey. So you need to be tall, thin, tiny 
and then you can be a great gymnast. So if you have a larger body size and weight and you start late in your life and your parents are, okay, now we're going to put you into a gymnast school. Uh, that's the parents' fault. You need to profile children before putting them into a certain sport. Uh, previous injury, like all the other sports, is again the greatest risk. And higher the competitive level, uh, more the issue. Certain routines like the balance beam, the parallel bars have been seen to uh, relate to more injuries. And uh, again, you need to take care of the year of peak height velocity. So if this is a different concept that we can talk about. And uh, that's, that's, that's a phase in which they see more injuries. Girls at higher risk. Uh, something that we want to discuss with gymnastics is that, of course, the techniques and the landing strategies, the body postures are more important. But most gymnasts and swimmers have learned over a period of time to work through pain. So we must tell these kids early in life that exertional soreness is different. So for adults, for example, when you go to the gym, the gym trainer always tells you that if you work hard, your muscles are going to get sore and that's something that's normal and expected. But we must be trying try and tell our kids that exertional soreness and pain due to injury are two different things and you must encourage a lot of child, coach, trainer and family interaction because you keep talking about this. Uh, one thing we want to discuss specifically with gymnastics and dancing, uh, certain other two, three sports is the female athlete triad. So you have uh, children, who, girls especially, who are not eating a lot because they want to stay thin. Uh, they start getting abnormal menstrual cycles and eventually go on to absence of menstruation and low bone density. So poor nutrition, low bone density and menstrual disturbance. Together, uh, surprisingly, if you see on the right hand side, this is a paper and uh, I don't have the reference here, but it's referenced that on a cross-sectional survey, 60 to 70% of uh, adolescent females uh, that's female high school athletes fall in this criteria for the triad. And this is something that we must protect our kids and adolescents from. So nutritional counseling is very important. And when you eat, 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 you can recover the energy status first. And that's a process in days or weeks. But the menstrual cycles are going to take months to recover. And we must explain to the adolescents that now that you're in this phase, if you're part of the triad, if you're in it, it's a slow process to come out of it. So to get over uh, and get better bone mineral density, to get stronger bones is going to be a process that's going to take years actually. So you can't be diagnosed with an athlete triad, uh, be told by the coach that, oh, you're eating too less, go on a program, diet program for one to two months and then expect to get back to competitive levels again. Uh, running is something that deserves a presentation on its own. So there are lots of things that we can talk about and uh, most of them can't be covered here. But anterior knee pain, uh, in children we see a lot of Sinding Yorts, Johansson and Osgood Schlatter uh, in runners and uh, those who are also used to a lot of skipping. And you see the green part here and that's what I'm going to focus on. That the green part says prevention includes you must run progressively and slowly. Young runners must run only on alternate days or they must alternate long and short distances on different days. They must alternate the running terrain. So that means you go running on the hill and then you go running flat the next day. Also, this is one of those sports where a pre-participation evaluation may help, especially if you have adolescents or kids who are trying to run the standard chartered or the Tata marathons or even the half marathons because uh, we've seen that certain endurance running competitions have a one in thousand incidence of an SCD that's a sudden cardiac death and we can protect those by selectively pre-participation screening. Swimming is mostly overused just like running. Uh, swimming begins at an early age so if you have parents who are enthusiastic swimmers uh, they want to put their kids into competitive swimming and the child's going to probably fall in, I mean, be taken to the pool at two years of age. Uh, and the progress levels are quick. So there are four essential strokes, freestyle, butterfly, backstroke and the breaststroke. 
and freestyle is the standard mode for training. Uh, and what's common is a swimmer's shoulder. So almost 40 to 50% of swimmers who are into competitive swimming, uh, whether it's sea swimming or otherwise, have a shoulder issue. And this is something that we must discuss. Also, something specific to breaststroke is a knee and a hip issue. So uh, you get these MCL grade one, grade two spains, and if it becomes overuse chronic, then you have a thickened medial plica that's giving the, uh, giving the kid an issue. And anterior knee pain is again very common. Now, what are the risk factors? Uh, as far as the shoulder is concerned, there is a lot of talk and controversy about you being, uh, you developing a shoulder dyskinesia uh, and shoulder asymmetry because there is a dominant side and a less dominant side. But essentially, muscle imbalances is something that we are working on to correct to reduce the incidence of shoulder problems. And as far as the breaststroke is concerned, uh, there has to be a lot of core training, a lot of VMO, vastus medialis obliquus strengthening to offset the problem of anterior knee pain, which is generally seen in kids with a valgus malalignment or uh, an intrinsic subtle patellar instability. What are the extrinsic factors? Uh, kids who are taught to start swimming with these boys, boys and paddles are supports which allow the kid to float better. Uh, again, that leads to an abducted internal rotated position which leads to more shoulder issues. And uh, you must remember that those who are progressing to competitive sports mustn't start strength training earlier. So we see this discussion with certain trainers these days where they say that, oh, the kid has to start building muscle soon. Unless they have strength, they are not going to swim hard and clock great times. Remember that strength training must begin only in skeletally mature swimmers. And uh, training like running should progress slowly. Uh, kids should be taught what fatigue mean, means and fatigue must be communicated. And the coach can't persistently... Go uh, just encourage swim, swim, swim. In an ideal scenario, you must stop at first sign of fatigue. Don't train with shoulder pain. So swimming is, uh, in, it involves 30,000 strokes per arm, 60 to 80,000 meters per week sometimes for elite, swimmer, uh, elite swimmers. And most of the torque is generated from the shoulder. And it's almost 35 to 40% of individuals complain of some sort of shoulder pain. And uh, this is just a photograph that talks about uh, the normal freestyle stroke and it involves a push and a pull. Uh, and what you can see on the right is a graph by the American Academy of Pediatrics and they, they screened high school athletes and you can see the proportion of shoulder pain and no shoulder pain. We're not talking about treating uh, shoulder pain that needs treatment, but it's just uh, the survey just asked them yes and no. And it's really high, the incidence. Of course, uh, there's a lot of discussion on the etiology. Uh, but what they say is initially, earlier, we used to talk about all of them having a GERD, that's an internal rotation deficit, which was leading to subacromial impingement and pain. Over a period of time, uh, the stabilizers aren't working that well. And all of these uh, kids as adults go on to develop uh, multidirectional instability. They have loose shoulders. Then you talk, the last discussion is on tennis and badminton. And you see the uh, contrast and similarities. So the lower limb is the most affected region in badminton as far as acute injuries are concerned and almost for overuse as well. Whereas in tennis, of course, it's the serve. The serve is biomechanically the most difficult and uh, that leads to a lot of overuse issues. Uh, this is, these are the classic sports where we must also talk about uh, trying to avoid early specialization. So if you go into tennis and badminton as a six-year-old, by the time you are 13, you are using only your one hand to play that sport. And life, you're going to face lifelong issues of dominant versus non-dominant. So you're going to have a dominant shoulder if you are into tennis. You're going to have a dominant knee and a dominant ankle if you're into badminton. And you can read through the overuse injuries seen in tennis and badminton and uh, the acute injuries as well. 
essentially again lot of anterior knee pain and ankle issues with badminton and uh, impingement and rotator cuff issues with tennis uh, tennis also has of course the elbow and the wrist issues as well uh, the tennis elbow so to say we can see that in badminton as well previous injury again is the biggest risk factor limited internal rotation in the dominant arm that's a glenohumeral internal deficit so gerd picked up in a pre participation evaluation can potentially be a modifiable risk factor for these kids and uh, it of course depends on training so that's why the coach is important the racket's important the grips important uh, the shuttlecock and the ball of course are the other risk uh, extrinsic risk factors you must focus on equipment uh, conditioning programs to work on scapular symmetries and uh, stretch 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 so sleeper stretch is something that's classic and we uh, i mean it's discussed because uh, in the us there's a lot of baseball and we don't talk about that here but internal rotation of the dominant arm is what uh, is a risk factor now tennis and badminton are classic like i said the aaos runs this great program that keeps talking to orthopedic surgeons physiotherapists kids athletes of course the kids are the ones who you want to convey everything to eventually and it's about one sport injury so don't put your kid into a sport at 5 and 6 and just focus on that one sport uh, forever you early specialization is a bad trend they must play multiple things talk of ab de villier and he's done pretty much everything and excelled in everything that he's participated in and that's because he didn't just play one sport so uh, when you talk of prevention these are the things that we must discuss and we can have a separate webinar on this that pre participation physical evaluations are very important so you pick up district national state under 11 under 13 under 15 under 17 kids and try and do a pre participation uh, annual evaluation for these cohorts try and identify the risk factors and there are several risk factors uh, which can be clocked so females have different issues and males have different issues and then you must talk to the coaches at the same time or when these kids come down for an evaluation then we make it a point to speak to the parents at the same time and talk about uh, you being there as a backup as the orthopedic surgeon so we are passive medical supervisors for them and we are always there to help them is the thing that needs to be conveyed the problem is that most kids of this generation uh, aren't playing as much so because they are not playing uh, of course they are playing but they are playing games and video games and we want them to go out more often so that uh, we can involve indirect forms of training and conditioning and such balance boards are available on amazon and flipkart but unless we start telling people that oh you can buy them there are still going to be parents who are going to buy playstations for their kids only the last and most important thing delayed specialization so you don't have to talk of tiger woods who took the golf club in his hand at 4 and became a national champion at 11 you must talk of roger federer who at 11 won a local tennis tournament and his mother said you're better off in the kitchen as a chef but eventually all of you know where roger federer is uh, i can uh, suggest to all of you that you download this app it's by the international olympic committee it's called get set train smarter this has a lot of exercises that are uh, stage based 1 2 3 sport based body based uh, 33 sports there and different body parts and it's it's a great thing for sports injury prevention for kids considering they're all tech savvy uh, all all the athletes that you know of around and your coaches and trainers must must download this app it's available both on uh, iPhones and on androids so that's the end of the presentation thank you so much and we are open for questions Yeah, so Jayant uh, has a couple of questions. First of all, thank you, Mitin, for an exhaustive talk. Uh, covered uh, quite more, and uh, you know, we more needs to be discussed because uh, 
everybody who deals with injury in a child needs to know about so many factors and i i, I confess that so many things were unknown to me like females getting more acl injuries than boys you know girls getting it more than the boys and we are actually seeing it in practice now with uh, you know girls soccer being promoted so much absolutely uh, so uh, 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 again you know in, uh, i would ask uh, uh, jayan jayan just unmute yourself and ask your questions some interesting questions from jayan hi uh, you can hear me yes 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 ah great so that was a fantastic talk thank you so much it was a real eye opener for all of us and i think as pediatric orthopedic surgeons we don't have much sports injury orientation we do tend to see these children but I'd give them generic advice but it's always good to have a specialist so um i see a lot of badminton and uh, tennis uh, overuse injuries <clears throat> both upper limb and lower limb uh, in in children who are less than 10 years old they are training crazy hours like 60 hours a week 80 hours a week right uh, they are not doing any full time education at all uh, is there any weekly time limit or daily time limit <clears throat> for kids or how do you you know really young kids like 8 year olds like last week i saw someone uh, eight eight year old training 80 hours a week in tennis it's crazy it's too much sir so uh, the general mandate is around uh, 40 to 50 hours for a certain sport you can stretch it to 60 if the child is playing two three things at the same time but two three pointers one uh, they shouldn't be at a competitive level in two sports at the same time because both the coaching sets on the two sporting sides will really push the kid beyond limits single sport 80 hours is just too much uh, so i think at uh, sai that's the sports authority of india training centers uh, the gopichand academy and the padukon prakash padukon academy at bangalore uh, so i have some insight over there and though they have uh, hostels and attached uh, residential premises they they have a limit on the working training hours so i'd be surprised if this kid that you're talking of 80 hours a week is from one of these academies uh, and that's why that's that's why this discussion is important that we go back and discuss this with our physios and our athletic trainers to let them know that uh, 80 hours is not allowed 60 if 40 to 50 hours a week uh, 8 hours a day is itself too much and uh, i I, 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 i can't i'm trying to back calculate 80 hours a week is too much is how, how many hours um so and they were very unapologetic the parents were very unapologetic and when i told them that they have to reduce the hours they shocked they thinking they you know first first thought they comes to mind is we'll find a different doctor right so, right right so yeah, jay jayat couple of things yeah, yeah. so What? one of the thing is that uh, uh, we always talk about reducing couple of hours just just imagine parent wants to send the child to medicine and you tell them limit the study hours to 8 hours a day not possible but it's, all, it's the, all the thankfully sir i'm going to stop you there but reading too much won't lead, lead to overuse brain injury whereas over it here does. <laughs> <laughs> no but but all the sports movies you know you take ikbal or you take uh, the wrestling movie where pogat was featured you know start they all started 5 in the morning and you know will power yeah. and extensive training and hard work that's what they underline so i think i think a great point is uh, which uh, i think uh, is ab de villiers who did multi sport uh, training i think that's a very nice way of perhaps you, i think uh, the best way to uh, the the be what works best is great analogies we must talk of all those uh, athletes that people have heard about and know about who've done the good things I think South Africa is a good example where they play cricket and rugby at the same time. Yes, yes. So a lot of the cricketers, <clears throat> they're all, uh, they, many of the South African cricketers are also rugby stars. So they go together. So I think, and it's two different sports that have complementary um, sort of in cricket. And I think, I think we should start promoting that. Uh, so that cricket and want... football generally go together. That's what uh -huh. uh, Virat Kohli and. now uh, the team is also trying to promote 
that yeah. uh, play play both together yeah, as you're growing as you're training especially in tier one cities now that's the culture that uh, if you're part of the club level cricket team and you're going up the ranks uh, y- you need to be a good footballer as well so mithin one more question in continuation with the same thought and rajiv has asked this question and uh, i'm going to put a corollary to it that he's asked a question that uh, should uh you know children with hyperlaxity be prevented from contact sports or does profile of a child whether he is stiff or strong or hyperlax allow you to choose a specific sports like how you said cricket and football go together so you know any such analogies or advices which can give to our parents this is a controversial issue actually so in certain sports like wrestling judo uh of course there is a higher propensity if you are hyperlax but they say that certain maneuvers especially the defensive skills uh, are intrinsically better if you are able to contort yourself better uh, same similarly in gymnastics there are certain routines or certain stretches and certain positions that you can get to even in dancing uh, better if you are hyperlax so you will do better in the sport if you are hyperlax so and no pre participation so when we do these pre participation evaluations you do mark out children who are more than 5 by 9 on batens but you can't prevent them from playing any particular sport because we have certain famous athletes who are hyperlax and still at the pinnacle of their individual sport are certain sports suited to hyperlax individuals uh yes and this is uh, specific to every single sport so when you talk of athletics for example so if you have great speed and agility uh, you are always forced by your coach more towards uh, speed sports compared to endurance sports so you'll always go into 100 meters and hurdles and what goes along with 100 meters and hurdles is long jump and triple jump so if your coach finds that uh, you maybe if you are hyperlax Uh, and you run not so good you will be forced more into a triple jump because you'll perform do- on those parameters much better so everybody finds their way nobody can be dissuaded on the basis of hyperlaxity but uh, we, i had mentioned this in the presentation there are certain european teams uh, soccer teams female soccer teams that bench hyperlax female players uh, during their ovulation period Okay. Any other questions from the people in audience? Uh, feel free to ask. Unmute uh, yourself and you can ask. Yeah. Doctor Mithen, we have seen lot of children with ligament laxity. So we just uh, think that the ligament laxity will help in sports career. Is it true or wrong? So it is prone for more injury. Both. so you can be better at a particular sport because you are hyperlax and you can get into certain positions and you mm-hmm. can be more prone to certain overuse injuries uh, like a hyperlax swimmer will always have less pain will always be able to get the stroke better faster compared to colleagues but eventually as an adult will always have multi directional instability and probably will go in for surgery in their 40s and 50s okay because we see lot of patient with ligament laxity with flexible flat feet the parent concern that they whenever they start running they fell down so we always think it is yeah, due to so vitamin d deficiency this is a very common question right jaydeep that they talk all almost all parents i think uh, as mostly at the yeah. orthopedics most of you must be receiving parents that ask what footwear should i wear my yeah. ch- child's foot appears to be flat should i change shoes can can the biomechanics by improved by shoes and i have had this discussion with abhishek kini who is a foot and ankle surgeon and he says that um, up to 12 and 14 uh, the body is still developing so your running biomechanics keep changing and the body keeps adapting to the shape of your foot uh, of course footwear is better than no footwear so in adults there is this uh, trend of barefoot running which, which we shouldn't encourage in children but we don't need to actively correct foot over pronation ankle eversion in younger children uh, unless it's significant so, uh, we had a uh, article by yeah please ask 
So what is the youngest uh, ACL reconstruction? Because now we are seeing ACL, ACL tears in yeah, under Eight 10. Years. And should it be reconstructed? I mean, I, I've kind of, yeah. I, I have a couple of uh, kids who are under 10 with proven ACL injuries uh, with clinical laxity. I am just pushing them to adolescence. Am I wrong or right? Evidence says you are wrong, sir. <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> So you um, and and uh, what is the incidence of having to uh, re revise it? You know, if I do recommend ACL reconstruction, will they need another ACL later? Most likely, forty percent. Okay. Uh, uh, Raymond Say, uh, he's from Luxembourg and uh, past president of ESCA, and he's um, on the board of ESACOS. He's done a lot of work on uh, pediatric ACL injuries, and the consensus is that. If you don't operate on them, you must reduce their competitive level. So if they're playing state, you have to unfortunately tell them you can't play state anymore. You can play district or lower. If you don't treat the ACL and the child continues at the same level, then the child's going to have meniscal and cartilage issues, which will give you more heartache and disappointment rather than just reconstructing an ACL. If you reconstruct an ACL in any kid less than 10 years of age, you know that there's a 40% chance that the same ACL is going to get torn and 40% chance that the kid's going to get an ACL in the other knee if the child plays the same sport at the same level. But we also know that most kids who are reconstructed this early, uh, between 50 and 80% are able to get back to the same level. Uh, otherwise, I think parents' prudence and uh, general observations mostly dictate that the kid won't go back to the same sport. They'll have this animosity to the sport because the sport then they associate with the surgery. The injury. Well, and, uh, and I think, what uh, about the uh, method of reconstruction? You do a standard uh, uh, hamstring? In, uh, in again, great question, sir. So we know that uh, these kids don't have good, I mean, they're going to have tiny hamstrings there. So anybody less than 10, we generally have the parent uh, in the Bajuka operating room. We've taken a consent and we use parent hamstrings. Wow. Okay. Uh, the only so, thing we match is the RH factor. That's it. Both kid and child have to be positive, positive blood group. That's it. No other uh, HLA compatibility or anything else is required. I've heard of parent liver. First time I'm hearing of parent hamstrings. No, it, uh, again, not uh, backed by evidence, sir. Very good. Very so, good. It's a, it's a, it's a material for a movie. You know, a Indian mother in a <laughs> village donating hamstring <laughs> the, for the child's future who has a ACL injury. So you know. Yeah. But anyway, but any especially just, true just, just, kids. Otherwise, we have something called as a fiber tape. So between ten and fourteen, we would augment the hamstring with uh, a fiber tape. Thanks, Mithen. It's 8 1. So we go by what is known as I fix standard time. We start on time and end on time. Perfect. Uh, and it's been an awakening hour. You know, we all woke up at 7 in the morning, but a lot of awakening in uh, the field of sports injuries. And uh, we are going to look forward to more from you, Mithen. On 3rd November, we'll have a follow up session where specific sports injuries and the landmark papers Mithen is going to uh, discuss on I fix. Uh, pediatric uh, orthopedic journal club and we will share these articles beforehand so people can read and come out with more questions and our motto is very simple we have to have answers to the questions but also there have to be answers which are questioned and uh, that's why this uh, Tuesday morning hour is very very important for us and uh, for those who have missed this live session it will be available on Ortho TV. Uh, we will also uh, uh, Dr. Vitin's uh, email address on that so that uh, people can ask questions to him. So for more questions and more answers, uh, we look forward to be meeting you, Mithin, again on 3rd November. Thank sure. you everybody for joining. We'll be talking about uh, specific injuries uh, related to pediatric and adolescent sports. Absolutely. Thank you so much thank, for thank it, you, everyone. Uh, everyone for their time. Thank you, Dr. Taral.